Hey everybody, uh, today I have privilege to talk to a really exciting person um, for my series of women in sports vlogs to honor the National Day of Women in Sports, February 4th. So today I have the incredible rower Je Janice Mason and I'm just going to introduce you Janice real quick here. She started her athletic journey as an eight-year-old because her mom wanted to make sure that she and her sisters knew how to swim since uh, her mom didn't know how to... Uh, she, uh, your Janice, your mother was afraid of uh, you going into water and not being able to swim, I guess. Basically, yeah, because her yeah. mother hadn't let her learn how to swim, basically, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, being too young to take the next swim class, Janice and her sister joined a local swim club. It was through swimming that Janice met, met Ina, a national team rower. This encounter planted the seed for Janice's rowing career that started two years later at the University of Victoria. Many national championships later, Janice's rowing years culminated as world champion in 1987 in the lightweight double skulls event. Other rowing highlights include being two-time Olympian, wins at head of the Charles Regatta and winning the prestigious Royal Henley Regatta in England. After rowing, Janice had a daughter and completed her studies to become a sports medicine physician and spent a number of years living and working in the Southern Gulf, by, uh, Gulf Islands of BC, Canada. Other adventures have included completing the race to Alaska on four separate occasions. We'll come back to this, I promise in three different types of boats, sail, row, and kayak. Her rowing involvement continues as an umpire, board member with OARCA Coastal Rowing Club and distributor of coastal rowboats. Wow. Um, Janice, Thanks. welcome. I am so excited to talk to you because I think I'm going to learn a lot. I, I'm going to reveal my ignorance of the sport of rowing. So please educate me. How did you, how did your rowing career start? So like you mentioned, I did, I started my athletic endeavors as a swimmer. And that was because my, my mom's mother was afraid of the water. And so my mom really didn't get the opportunity to learn how to swim. And so she felt it really important for her children to, and living on an island, I agree. I think it's incredibly important that people are comfortable around the water. Um, but at the age of eight, at that time, I don't know what it's like now, but at that time, the Red Cross swimming classes meet, needed you to be 13 to go on to the next level. And so we started swimming and I mean, I just took to the water and I love swimming and I still swim to this day, do lots of ocean swimming and swim with the master's group. Um, but yeah, in grade, I think it was grade 10. I was in a summer swim club and I met uh, Ina, who's the coach of the club and she was on the national team. And I'd never heard of rowing, never seen, like I've heard of rowing in a rowboat and I'd been in dinghies myself, but I'd never been in a sliding seat rowboat. And I talked about it and I just thought, hmm, that sounds good. I'm going to do that when I finish high school and start university. Uh, well, rowing opportunities are incredible now, like kids can start rowing pretty young and there's high school leagues in Victoria. When I was that age, there was no rowing for girls in high school it was sort of considered an elite sport and maybe the private boys schools, the boys could row, but mm -hmm. at university, it was just taking off. And in my first year at University of Victoria, um, I think there were two experienced rowers in a crew of eight and the rest of us were novices. And we were the, we were the varsity team and now it's really hard to get onto the team at UVic. So things yeah. have progressed quite a lot since then, but that was what, almost 50 years ago. Yeah. So you you it was that a, a female only team? Uh well there was a yeah Uvic men yeah had it and then there was a women's team separate okay. and we, we had our own coach yeah okay so you you guys were really trailblazers for women in rowing then yeah kind of the next tier I think the the woman I met Ina she and her her cohort were the real tra trailblazers mm -hmm. rowing was, the first time rowing was in the Olympics for women was in 1976. And I started rowing in 1977. Yeah. And I think a lot of credit has to go to the athletic director uh, at UVic at the time. 
Ken Shields, he was really helpful in pushing women's sports. So that was really good. Back that's, then. that's awesome. And then you go on to become one of the best in, in rowing. Um, how was your experience there? Like as a woman, uh, in team Canada? Um, I think it was good. I don't really feel like I, um, it was any more challenging for women than men mm -hmm. at the time. But I, I did row my last couple of years as a lightweight rower, which meant that I had to provide all my own funding. So that was mm -hmm. a setback because as a when I made it to the national team, we we were carded and provided some funding and travel expenses and overseas expenses were covered. But then I decided I was going to row lightweight because I, I took a year off after the 1984 Olympics. And I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what I was going to do. And I thought, OK, take a year off. And then I I've never been a, considered big. And one of the coaches at the university actually told me, well, if you were starting to row now, we probably would discourage you because I'm about, I'm a bit shorter now, but <laughs> at the time I was about just under five foot eight and about 145 pounds. And that's kind of small for a, an open class rower. Uh -huh. So I, I went into lightweight rowing, lost a few pounds and trained really hard. And But it was more challenging in terms of the support that one received yeah um, in sport but I didn't really notice I can't say I really noticed differences between men and women in the actual um opportunities for rowing but they were probably there I just was maybe too focused on what I was doing to be aware of some of the challenges yeah. I think I'm more aware now yeah now that I'm immersed in the sport so much yeah and then um you became a sports physician had your daughter Yep. Uh, did you did you continue in rowing like recreationally after your active career? I I did. I um I didn't really do too much rowing initially. I got involved in a kayak business and was a mm -hmm. partner in the kayak business for a while. And then we found out about some ocean rowing shells, and so that got me back into rowing. And so I would go out my rowing shell, which is kind of a cross between a, a racing shell, which is the really, really skinny boat that people see in the Olympics and the, the coastal boats that I'm using now. Uh, this boat that I used was a, a bit narrower than a coastal boat, but more stable than a racing shell. So a bit more comfortable to go out rowing and like the, the racing shells are pretty tippy if you're just out for enjoyment. And if the weather gets bad, it can be quite challenging. So right. um, I just started rowing around Sydney and the Gulf Islands. I mean, not around, but in that area. And so that so, was back in the 90s and then kind of got away from it and did a lot of kayaking. And then back in, I guess, around 2015, got back into rowing a bit more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and now I heard about this race to Alaska, ultra yeah. run, uh, ultra rowing. I I just went in and looked at it and it is incredible. So for everybody who doesn't know, Race to Alaska explained, it's a two-stage race, correct? Mm -hmm. um, it starts from Port Townsend, Washington. Um, and then the first stage is to row from Port Townsend to Victoria, BC. That's correct. And then from Victoria, you row all the way up to Alaska. So That's right. it's 750 miles long and mm -hmm. I cannot even imagine all the adventures and challenges and the beautiful nature that you encountered during those 750 miles. Tell me, tell me about your experiences. You've done it three or four times. Well, I finished four. it four times. Yep. Yeah. Oh, finished. Okay. So have you like, attended? Started six, finished four. Okay. The, the race started in 2015. Yeah, and it, it's a non-motorized boat race, so any boat can go in it that doesn't have a motor. And there's a mixture of boats, but mostly sailboats. So there's these big sailboats and little sailboats, and they all have to take their engine out. And they have to figure out a way of moving the boat when there's no wind or when they have to get someplace where you're not allowed to have your sails. Like coming into Victoria, you have to put your sails down when you get around a certain point. And then there's a small number of uh, human power boats so kayaks rowboats uh, it's been finished in a stand-up paddleboard oh. um canoe so 
Um, wow. I, I, I heard about it in 2015 when it first half first started and I tried to get someone to go in it with me. I was looking to my rowing club teammates and they all go, oh, that sounds like a great idea, but no thanks. So, <laughs> um, so I had to watch the race in 2015 on the computer. Yeah. And then by chance, I stumbled upon somebody's Facebook posting about sister ship needing another crew person and sister ship was a sailboat and I have next to no sailing experience. But I figured, you know, I'm adventurous. I had done the Yukon River Quest a couple of times, which is this really cool uh, race from Whitehorse up to Dawson City in the Yukon. And I did that by kayak a couple of times, and that was a three, two or three-day event. And I thought, oh, I, I really love to do the coast. Like, the coast is sort of one of those things I've wanted to do for a long time. Yeah. Or you paddle around Vancouver Island in a kayak. Um, so anyway, I, I reached out to Sister Ship. And event, for, or first they said no. They're like, oh, well, we need someone with sailing experience. And yeah, you sound like you're quite an adventurer, but we want someone who can sail. Um, but I didn't deter me. I actually went down to Port Townsend in February of that year to meet with the skipper of sister ship just to kind of say, yeah, I'm really interested. And eventually it led to April. They had a crew change. Some people had had to drop out and yeah. they called me up and said, hey, are you still interested? And I said, of course. Yeah. And so uh, that was a, that was a challenging experience. Uh, it took us eleven days. We had a lot of days of rowing a twenty seven hundred pound twenty seven hundred pound boat, which is not easy. You know, no. There were two rowers, one with a sweep oar on each side, and that's quite a bit of work. Yeah. And when I got there, I thought mm, that was a great experience, but I really liked to row it because that was my first interest in doing it, and I had met. Ian Graham, he was on a team, the same type of sailboat on Team Fly. We met in Port Townsend at the start of the 2016 race, and he was from Victoria as well. And we hooked up afterwards and chatted and went out rowing a few times. And long and short, uh, he agreed to row with me the next year. So we became Team Oracle. And so in 2017, we took just over three weeks to row all the way to Alaska from Victoria. And that led to, oh, well, we've done it backwards. I mean, rowing is really, really hard. Yeah. Because uh, you, you can't see where you're going. And we didn't have mirrors. We, it was, we were both working full time. We didn't have time to fix up the boat completely the way we wanted to. And we didn't have any mirrors, which you would think that'd be a simple thing to do. But anyway, it didn't happen. And it was quite stressful going backwards in yeah. new territory with currents and rocks and trying to avoid boats and yeah. All Thing. So at the end of it, you know, I kind of thought, okay, I've done it. I don't need to do it again. <laughs> but it sort of, it sort of catches you. Like it's just an amazing experience. It's not just about the adventure up the coast. There's this huge community of people, not only the racers who are doing it, they're all kind of crazy and willing to put themselves out there, but there's this huge following of people that follow along and they've been caught, known as tracker junkies. And these people will, <laughs> follow along because you can follow people on the computer with we all have a little spot device so it yeah. tracks our position as we go and people will offer you a place to stay they offer meals they run down to the beach with bags of fruit or cups of coffee and it's just this really really nice community um, that supports people because I keep thinking I, you know I could do this row or paddle up the coast without paying thousands of dollars to be part of an event but it just yeah. doesn't happen same kind of allure that that is that is so amazing um uh, both the the crazy people actually doing it but <laughs> the, the the people who are tracking um so it's non-supported so what do you carry in in your in your boat so yeah it's an it's an unsupported race but it's not sort of unsupervised like there are uh, clearly people following along the way because we all have these spot devices the, yeah. the race officials track us mm -hmm. and the coast guards aware of the whole event but we basically have to carry everything we need or we can stop along the way and and buy it or if someone uh, has something that they can offer like sometimes people have had equipment failures and people along the way have helped with the repairs yeah, yeah. but we carry our food most for most of the way like we do 
at least in the southern part, we can stop and get some food up to, up to Campbell River. There's there's quite a few resources in north of Campbell River. It really really falls off. Yeah. Uh, I I spent quite a few weeks dehydrating lots of food because okay. I found yeah. after, after 2016 we had commercially prepared meals, and I just yeah. found that, I don't know I didn't feel well. So so yeah. we make our own food. Uh, we carry enough water for, usually for two or three days, but there's lots and lots of places to get water along the coast and initially you could stop in marinas and then once you get farther north there's just lots of streams and we would filter our water and carry enough for two or three days yeah uh, venting we would camp most of the way um we've been offered places on sailboats to stay so we've stayed on people's boats uh we found cabins along the way so you get pretty resourceful we slept on the dock in a few places yeah we slept at on the way back, I mean, getting there is one thing, then you have to get back. And we've slept uh, with our tent pitched at the ferry terminal in, in Prince Rupert. Um, so did, did you uh, did you take a ferry down or did you <laughs> row back home? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, were, we needed to get back. Uh, actually, the first year that I went in the rowboat with Ian, we, we didn't anticipate taking as long. And so we both had to call work and ask for extra time off. Yeah. Which they very kindly granted us. And then there's this ferry when it runs it goes from Ketchikan to Bellingham and it's an amazing way to relax and unwind and slowly reintegrate into society and, and yeah. see the uh, passage that we just made um, but in 20, 2022 and we did it the last time we did it by kayak we took the ferry to Bellingham and then we paddled home from Bellingham back to Victoria it took us a couple of days wow but we were both we were both retired at that point, so we yeah. could take take the time. But I mean, we find that the farther north we go, the the more we sort of unwind. Like mm -hmm. it's really it's quite busy till you get to Campbell River, and then you get through Seymour Narrows, and it really opens up, and it's much more remote. And then as soon as you get to once you get to Bella Bella, beyond that, so that's kind of the halfway point. But north of Bella Bella, there's really a lot less in the way of support and resources and it's just it's just beautiful and I just yeah. kind of goosebumps and a little angst in my stomach when I when I think about it I just love being out there do you feel like you're you're part of nature like you're one with nature when when you get to those remote areas yeah yeah you just yeah because you don't have the computer beckoning all the time and you yeah. don't have phones and you don't have traffic and it's just yeah you, you learn to rely on each other and so yeah we, and I've got a really good um, relationship and support each other and sort of take on different roles and yeah it's just you're, you're living day to day and moment by moment and it's just it's, it's beautiful you know, yeah. oh you you got me sold on that I might <laughs> I might have to do that race one day um so you're you're putting in quite long days rowing like how long how many hours per day would you row so the rowing we found we couldn't spend as much time on the boat as when we were kayaking so rowing was faster but kayaking we could put in longer days so rowing I would say eight to ten hours yeah with the kayaking we were putting in up to 16 hours some days yeah and the thing about that is that sometimes the easy part because when you get to shore you've got to get your boat up above the tide yeah. high tide line you've got to unpack set up your tent cook your food yeah crawl to bed yeah <laughs> and and do all that in the morning. So, you know, even even getting to shore, I found in 2022, it was just a bit, I, my mind was kind of numb. I was so tired and I had to really force myself to, okay, you got to do this and then you've got to do that because you're just so tired. You kind of, oh, where's that person to help set up my yeah. tent or with my food? Yeah. And I mean, Ian and I had each other, but there's people who do it solo. Oh, wow. And that, to me, that's just incredible. Yeah. Like, not not just the paddling rowing part but the the whole rest of it yeah um so you you mentioned uh uh relationship like the first first time first time around with Ian your your rowing partner um how did that affect your relationship did it like deepen it or did you how did you handle all the dynamics there so that was uh, jokingly referred to as the longest first date because Ian and I, 
we we only met in 2016 at the start line before that race and we we thought well this is a good way to test our relationship this yeah. is a good way to figure out well will we will we survive into say retirement um and, and i mean it, it has it's just been a really positive experience and because we both had done the race before and had this very similar interest yeah um it's just yeah our relationship just kind of built from there oh that's so beautiful yeah i guess if you can spend three weeks with one other person completely you know doing things and it, it's not doing like hard have... things too not just yeah. doing one thing but incredibly hard physically mentally <laughs> and it's not that we haven't had our, our challenges or our disagreements but and I come from a very competitive background, so very disciplined and get up at five, do your workouts, and you just kind of bang, 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 you do it. And yeah. Ian's background isn't quite the same. Yeah. He's not really a morning person, and but he, I, I couldn't really push him to get up early. He was the one who suggested, oh, maybe we should be getting up at four. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. But, but I would get up at four. <laughs> And I found that with rowing, at, at first it was really challenging for my back and I would have to kind of move around for a while. So I'd get up yeah. at four. He'd roll over onto my thermo rest because my thermo rest was more comfortable. And then I would get up and make coffee and walk around and just kind of limber up. And then he would roll out of bed maybe 4.30, quarter to yeah. five. Yeah. But it, it would always take us at least a couple of hours to get on the water. So that was uh, always a bit challenging. But I think we just learned to to have a lot of trust in each other yeah. and I, I learned there's more than one way to do things and just because I think this is the way it should be done doesn't mean that that's the only way so learning to to navigate those those waters and those challenges was a big part of it and I think it just helped to make our relationship stronger yeah that that sounds like a pretty awesome epic first date <laughs> <laughs> um so tell me tell me about the two times you didn't finish like what 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 went on there uh, um so 2019 we had done it in so sailboat 2016 rowboat 2017 kayak 2018 we should have stopped there you know you we've done it in three different boats why do we keep need to going to keep on going but anyway we decided to do it again in in 2019 and just a few challenges. We were helping a crew do another race. There's another race that the organizers of the race to Alaska put on that's called the 7048. And, and actually in 2018, the first time they had it, we did the 7048 by rowboat and then got in our kayaks and did the race to Alaska, which that's a story in itself. But in 2019, we were helping another crew. Ian got a bit of a respiratory infection. The weather was not good. So you're given 36 hours to get from Port Townsend to Victoria and it's across, across Juan de Fuca Strait, mm -hmm. which in my opinion is the, the most challenging part because there isn't really any place to hide if the mm -hmm. weather is bad, it's mm -hmm. bad and you have to suck it up. Um, but they also call that the proving ground. So some people will only do that part, but to get permission to go on to Alaska, you have to complete the first leg in 36 hours. So 2019, it was, it was quite windy. Uh, a number of us ended up going only halfway, which we, we, instead of rowing diagonally across from Port Townsend to Victoria, it's kind of this nice 45 degree angle. We uh, hugged, hugged the coast a little bit in Washington and stopped at Dungeness Spit which if you've anyone's heard, heard of it, it's a beautiful place and it's it's worth going to. There's a, a lighthouse there and volunteer uh, lighthouse keepers can go and look after the place for a week. And you can't drive in there. You have to walk in or you can land by boat. So a bunch of us just decide, okay, we're going to get here and, and just kind of wait it out. And they were very kind. The volunteer lighthouse keepers let us put our tents up and they uh, fed us cookies and kind of looked after us and the next morning so we stayed the night and the next morning uh the weather was looking a bit better and most there were I don't know there were maybe 10 12 people that had landed there and Ian and I just timed it a bit late we we were waiting for it to calm down and we had to be aware of the tides because there's this quite a big tidal flow mm -hmm. when the tide's going out it'll suck you out to the pacific if it's coming in it'll suck you up uh, into georgia strait and we just 
misjudged it a little bit. Like if, if people look at the tracker, they can see that we were going in a nice trajectory to Victoria. And then it was almost like we hit the border, like halfway across was the border between the US and Canada. Our, our boat took a sharp turn to the right and it was still it was still pretty rough, but we basically uh, ran out of time. We got to, we managed to get to a golf course right at the, the tip of um, Victoria, the Royal Victoria Golf Course. Um, landed there. We had an hour left to get to the, into the inner harbor, and we knew because the tide had changed, and we'd be fighting the tide. And mm -hmm. we knew we didn't have enough time by boat to get all the way around. So we thought, oh, we're gonna. We have these wheels in our kayak because I had taken the kayak over on the ferry to Port Angeles, and we put the kayak on the wheels and skirted the golf course green and the. Golfers were very kind and they let us go through and said, yes, safety first. And <laughs> anyway, we figured, you know, it's about five kilometers from there to Victoria into the inner harbor. And we thought, oh, we can do it. But towing a kayak, running in flip flops. Oh, my God. So we we basically had this guy. Ian's running along. I'm trying to catch up, but he's I don't know, he's either barefoot or wearing flip flops and I'm the same. And. We were going down Fairfield Avenue and into Victoria and like the, a couple of police cars passed us. They didn't say anything. I thought, this isn't, do people do this all the time? And only, I think one or two people said anything to us. One person was annoyed because we blocked their way on the sidewalk <laughs> when we got close to the Empress. And anyway, we got, we got to the Inner Harbor about 30 minutes late. Oh, so, so we missed the cutoff. All um, that, all that running in flip flops through a golf course, through the streets of Victoria. Oh, bummer. That's but that's a good, a good it's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And, uh, a lot of people were quite upset that they didn't let us go on because yeah. I mean, we had done the race, we made the crossing before, but yeah. I mean, I, I totally understood because they had rules, and if they start letting you know one crew have an exception then where do yeah. you stop That's and there had been some really tight finishes there was one crew that actually uh, capsized as they were coming into victoria managed to get everything back in their boat into their boat and they made it to the finish line with 15 minutes to spare yeah so you know that's that's a neat story and yeah so it made sense for us to to go on with, yeah. yeah um let me talk about women in these ultra rowing events. Are there many? There, uh, there are, are getting to be more. I mean, there's some really big rowing events like the one that's going on now across the Atlantic. And there's one that goes, I think it goes from California to Hawaii. Yeah. And there are actually quite a few women doing those things. And in the race to Alaska, there are becoming more and more women. I mean, there's been at least two uh, double women rowboats that have finished the race to Alaska, uh, a crew from the East Coast of the US and then a crew mm -hmm. with uh, one, maybe maybe they're both Canadian, but uh, a national team rower from Canada, Carling Zeman did it in 2022 with um, Michelle. And then there were a sister pair that did it from the States. Yeah. There's been a woman in a, in a solo who's tried it a couple of times, but so, you know, there definitely are uh, more women in 2022 when we finished, there were the two women's doubles and then Ian and myself, I think we're the only human powered crews to finish. So more mm -hmm. women than men that year, whereas last year there were more men than women that did it human powered. Um, one of the things that hasn't happened yet though, is there hasn't been a solo female participant in the race to Alaska to complete it. Yeah. So where it's been, there's been quite a few men. So that means solo in sailboat, rowboat, whatever. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of think I should try, but I kind of like doing it with, with someone else. It's nice to share the experience. Nice to yeah. share the and the, and the highlights. And also just when you're on shore, it's nice to have mm -hmm. somebody else to help out with things. So would that be considered solo if you are doing it in solo kayak with mm -hmm. another person, like both of both in each one of kayaks? Yes, yes. So you so can that, still... that, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um and how, and how sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say some of the solo paddlers do that. They they team up just to have that 
companionship and probably support on the beach. So that that has yeah. happened where people have done that. Yes, yeah. alone but together. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a such a beautiful adventure. Mm -hmm. Um so how how would you encourage more women get into this? Just I think there's lots of women who maybe just need that nudge to know that it it is possible and um some people say oh I I could never do that. I remember taking up unicycling years ago and someone said oh I could never do that. And I'm like well if you say you can't you won't but if you you know think that it's a possibility then then why not go for it um I, yeah i think it's just people women need to to know that they're they're just as capable as men and there's lots of moral support and the challenges i think in some ways the challenges women are better at handling than men yeah um like you know childbirth for example is is no easy thing and i remember when i was I had my daughter, a rowing friend to me said, oh, what's it like compared to a, a 2000 meter rowing race? And I just had to laugh because it's completely different. You have no control, right? Yeah. The Your labor starts and yeah. the, your child comes when it wants to, and you just yeah. have to go with it. Whereas any kind of sporting event, you can stop, right? I mean, unless yeah. you're in the middle of the ocean, you kind of have to keep going, but something like a 2000 meter rowing race may last six to eight minutes and yeah. it's just it's a piece of cake compared to to childbirth <laughs> yeah i i totally agree i have three children all natural births and those are my biggest accomplishments and uh also the biggest challenges that i feel like i, I have no control over so i do ironman triathlon so my my big race days are uh 11 12 hours and every time I think of my kids, when when the going gets tough, I think of my kids and what I've already gone through. And this is like, oh, this is piece of cake. Like this is nothing, right? Okay. Um, so we women have incredible power in us. And, you know, it's all about mindset. We can do hard things. And oftentimes we can surprise ourselves what we can do if we yeah, just yeah, allow definitely. ourselves. Um, how do you feel like uh, getting older has affected your rowing, if if it has <laughs> at all? Because so you're you're active, you're you're swimming and rowing and yeah. So I think I think it has definitely affected my abilities. Uh, I had a hip replacement a couple of years ago, and I still find sitting is a bit challenging, sitting on a rowboat or a rowing ergometer. I I just have to have a little bit more um, patience and not be so push myself so hard. So I think that's just understanding one's body and knowing you can still do things. You just have to maybe take a, a little bit more time and it doesn't always have to be a race. That's the yeah. thing about rowing to Alaska. It's definitely not, I mean, it's a race, but it's not a race because you can't row at race pace. You just have to kind of go at a, a nice steady walking pace and yeah. take, take breaks more frequently and just, get more sleep if possible yeah um, I, I think recovery is a little bit longer and clearly with any injury it seems to take a little bit longer to recover yeah and being being aware of the need to keep on with the strength training I think that's pretty critical and one thing that I'm a, I'm a bit of a adrenaline or I don't know adrenaline I am cardiovascular endurance junkie I love those long long events and so, you know, taking the time to do the strength training, it's like, oh, but I'd rather sit on my rowing ergometer or go for a bike ride than do some strength training. Yeah, I I hear you. I hear you. Uh, that that athlete in you is still still there. I I I can I can hear that. Yeah. Um, did motherhood change the way you you perceived being an athlete and? Did it make you less adventurous? Did motherhood? No, actually, motherhood yeah. made me more, more adventurous. Oh, really? When I was younger, I I didn't do these long kind of adventure races. I um, Let's see. When my daughter was first born, I was still rowing and kayaking. And she was five weeks old when she went on her first kayaking trip with me from, it was only a couple hours, Island View Beach into Sydney. And then took her camping when she was four months old in a all women's kayaking trip. So 
Oh, she's wow. been exposed to it and she's not a competitive athlete. She is competitive, but uh, I've never pushed her into sports other than to say, Hey, you know, let's get you, you need to be active. It doesn't matter what yeah. you do. You just need to be active. And she actually took up rowing for a little bit, but it wasn't because of me. It was because her friends were doing it. And I think she tried to avoid it because she didn't want to do it because her mom had done it. Yeah. Um, but it, for, for me, as she got older, I was able to do more and um, take more time. And I, I guess I sort of developed this interest in these longer events when a friend of mine brought the Yukon River Quest to my attention. And sort of after that was when I started to do more of these things. So I had I had always had this dream to kayak around Vancouver Island or when mm -hmm. I was younger, I thought, oh, I'll swim around Vancouver Island. But I would definitely not swim around Vancouver Island, but I still would like to, and I still haven't yet gone around Vancouver Island, but uh, maybe this year or next we'll get a chance to do that. Yeah. Amazing. I, I love that goal. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, go on Google and just check out how big uh, Vancouver Island is. It's not a small island. island so that's a, another ultra event for sure. Yeah, it's it's basically the same distance as the race to Alaska. So yeah. The race is north and Vancouver Island, and you're just basically going around. So yeah, and the West Coast definitely is very remote and exposed and and challenging. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So, um, are you working? Are you working with the women in in rowing in any way? So yeah, seems like I never get rowing out of my blood. Um, a few years ago, uh, we hosted the Coastal World Rowing Championships in Sydney and formed a small association, which has now become a club, and that's ORCA. So the OARCA is Open Aviron Rowing Coastal Association, which obviously is quite a mouthful. So ORCA is much easier to say, but yeah. it's ORCA with an A. And so we're we're working to get more coastal rowing happening because most of the rowing in Victoria is done in fairly sheltered waters and with coastal rowing, meaning on the ocean or bigger bodies of water, you just you have equipment that can handle it. And you have, I think, so many more opportunities. Um, so you can go camping, go in rougher conditions, do surfing kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. they've actually have got a discipline and it'll start in the 2028 Olympics for beach sprints rowing. And it's done on the ocean in these coastal boats, which are more stable. And it's a short 250 meter out around some buoys and 250 meter back with a run on the beach to start and end the race. So super spectator friendly and media friendly and exciting to watch. Um, so I'm involved in a club that's supporting those aspects of rowing. Um, and also just trying to ensure that that women are given the opportunities uh, in not just rowing, but in coaching. And I think it's a real challenge as as women move up in the coaching world and, you know, motherhood and different needs and interests and goals, uh, I think, affects women's ability to maybe pursue that in the same way that men can. Mm. So there's, there's definitely some challenges in that mm -hmm. um, just somehow got involved in that and trying to support women in those roles and i guess to me my father was really supportive of his three daughters and basically kind of told us that you know not in so many words but supported us to to become become leaders and um, do the best we can and I think that's helped in just being, for me, being determined and focused and continuing on and, and not being, not willing to take no mm -hmm. for an answer. I just, I know if you don't ask for something, you're not going to be given the opportunity. And, and maybe too, as I become older, I'm not so worried about what other people think and just kind of push through. Yeah. Wise words, wise words. Thank you so much. Uh, We'll link to Orca uh, Coastal Rowing Club underneath this video. Is there any other um, social media platforms that you want us to link to? Yes, my my swim group, my open water swim swim group, the Aquanuts. Okay, awesome. Uh, we'll we'll, awesome. we'll post Sorry, those. It's, it's Aquanuts, not knots, because <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love that. I love that. 
Thank you so much. I've learned so much and I really I'm going to I'm going to become one of those uh trackers for next year's race to Alaska. It sounds such a epic adventure. Thank you so much Janice for taking time uh, and uh sharing your experiences and your wisdom today. And oh, thank you. It's been lovely chatting with you. Yeah, awesome. Uh I will look you up when I come to Victoria on an East Souk perhaps mm -hmm. because uh I would love to go for an awesome swim with you. Oh excellent. And we'll get you up rowing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would love that. I grew up rowing on the river, like with the rowboat. <laughs> um, that was fun. I, I used it as a training for cross-country skiing in the summertime. Yeah, that sounds good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.